Okay, so I guess it's time to get started uh, again. So, uh, welcome back for the last day of talks here. And yeah, it's quite loud, actually. Okay. Okay. So um, today, I would like to talk about <coughs> uh, talk about a collection of objects called combinatorial filters. Um, Okay, so um, let me give some, intu some intuition about uh, what that means. Uh, in the robotics community, there's been, uh, been some work developing over the last uh, maybe 10 years or so, and, and you've seen some examples of this in my earlier talks. Uh, the basic idea behind this, this idea of combinatorial filters is this. Uh, rather than, than using the, uh, the traditional approach of uh, of dealing with the physical world using using continuous quantities and very powerful sensors and all these kinds of things, uh, <coughs> the approach we take for for combinatorial filters is to uh, is to look for for very simple, very discrete kinds of representations of of what we know about the, the physical world. Right. So uh, there's one example here that uh, that you've seen already. So these gap navigation trees have that feeling as well. Right. Rather than uh, trying to build a detailed map uh, that, that shows what the world looks like, um, you know, we, we talked about how to, uh, how to represent uh, a map of the environment using just a, just a simple, uh, simple rooted tree. But there's a lot of other work that, that also fits in this category. So, uh, so for example, uh, my, my colleague Jing Jin Yu and Steve Laval have, uh, have a family of algorithms that they call uh, shadow information spaces that, that are useful for observing the movements uh, of other people, you know, robots, uh, other kinds of agents that, uh, that are moving into and out of the robot's field of view and keeping track of, of what we know about where those, uh, where those agents might be. Uh, and there's also a... Uh, oh, um, okay. And there's also this large family of work on... Um, for example, uh, beam sensors. So again, it's uh, remarkably difficult to see there in the, uh, in the image. But the idea is that um, we have some beam sensors placed throughout the environment. And uh, when an agent moves over one of those beams, we, uh, we know which beam was crossed. Right? So uh, I haven't seen these here in Iran yet. But uh, the basic idea is that. Uh, you know, sometimes in the United States, when we walk into a store, there's a, there's a, a pad you step on and a bell rings so that the, uh, the workers in the store know that you're there, right? That's the kind of sensor we're talking about here, something that, that gives you one bit, uh, somebody crossed this beam or not, right? Um, and, and actually, as you can see, there's, uh, uh, there's a, a large and actually growing family of papers that deal with various kinds of, uh, of questions we might ask about... Uh, about where the agents are based on the observations we get from these kinds of beams, right? So, so there's a lot of work in this area. Um, but one thing that, okay, well, let, let me show you a, a very specific example. Uh, we can zoom in sort of very closely on, on one. So, uh, so here's the problem. On the left, uh, in this problem, there are two agents that are moving around a, uh, well, it's too bad David's gone because I've got a donut too, uh, moving around a donut shaped environment. Uh, right, so, so you can see them there in, in blue and green, and I've, I've just drawn in one, uh, one potential path that each one of those might follow. And within that environment, we also have three beam sensors, and those are marked A, B, and, a, B, and C. Right? Um, and I, I'm marking them sort of evenly distributed through the environment, but that, that part actually isn't too important. Okay, so, so we have two agents moving, uh, moving amongst three beams. Right? And the question we would like to ask is, based on the, the observations from those beams, based on a sequence that says somebody crossed A, somebody crossed B, somebody crossed A, somebody crossed C. And so we get this sequence. Based on that sequence, can we figure out whether these two agents are in the same place or in different places? Right? So yeah, it turns out to actually be very, very important for these kinds of questions to, to know not just what information uh, are your sensors collecting, but also what kinds of questions you want to be able to answer from that information. Right? Okay, so, uh, so that's the problem. Uh, two agents moving in, a, uh, in an annulus environment amongst three beams, and the question is, are they together or apart? Right? Okay, so how can we solve this? Well, one very natural way to start might be uh, just to start enumerating all the possibilities. 
Right? So if I, if I freeze the system at one, uh, one time step, or one instant, then, um, then, well, I guess the information that matters is for each of these two agents, which, which section of the annulus is it in, right? So, uh, so for the blue one, we have three possibilities. Uh, I'm, I've actually labeled them here. Zero, region zero, region one, and region two. Right? So for the blue one, we could, it could be in zero, one, or two, and the green one could be in zero, one, or two, right? So if I freeze things, uh, I know everything will be in one of nine states, right? Um, of course, I may or may not have enough information from my observations to figure out whether, whether um, well, to figure out exactly which of those nine, uh, those nine states I'm in, right? Uh, so, so it might be tempting to try and say, ah, oh, let's, let's guess, what, let's figure out what the state is and then just keep track of it as the, as the beams are crossed. Uh, we can't do that, but, um, but maybe we can track, uh, keep track of, uh, of sets of possible states. So we've got nine different states we could be in, and for each one we can say, well, is it, does, this, does the sequence of observations we've got match with, um, with this individual state, right? Uh, so we get, uh, for nine states, I guess two to the ninth power different, uh, different sets of information states we could get, right? Is it, is it clear why, why I'm saying two to the ninth, right? I'm seeing one nod and uh, n minus one blank stairs. Yeah. Oh, okay, so, um, so the idea is uh, we want to keep track of uh, what do we know about where these guys can be, right? Um, <laughs> So one possibility is, um, uh, well, one is shown here. Maybe that matches what we've seen, maybe it doesn't, right? And for this state, we have a bit, zero or one, right? Now we can imagine uh, maybe the green one is over here. Um, let me ask, you know, is that possible based on what we've seen, zero or one, right? So we end up with, uh, with nine different bits, and of course there's 512 different ways of, of filling in those nine different bits, right? Uh, well, I guess we can... I guess we know the agents are in there somewhere, so we can eliminate one of those, right? So we know that, uh, uh, <coughs> um, okay, so, so that's the idea. Uh, one very natural way to do this would be to draw a graph with 512 nodes and start drawing edges in between, right? So, so for example, from this state, uh, if we observe a C, then we know that the green one's moved over here, right? So, so we can draw this big graph, and actually I, I tried to draw it for you, um, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's so ugly as to be, uh, as to be illegible. So, so I skipped that and went just straight to the very nice result that, that was shown by, um, uh, by Tovar Cohen and Laval a few years ago. Uh, but it turns out that you don't need 512 vertices to, to keep track of whether these agents are in the same place or in different places. It turns out you can do it in just four. Uh, four states. Uh, maybe uh, you've just been kind of fascinated by the, by the final answer here the whole time. So here's the idea. Uh, we'll have one state, uh, or one, one state in the middle, corresponding to the, um, uh, <coughs> corresponding to the two, uh, two agents being in the same place. Right? So, so the, way, the way to read this is that uh, each one of these elements in, in any of the sets represents one state, right? So zero, zero means that both of them are in state, uh, state zero, right? Um, right, so two, two means that they're, they're both in, uh, in state two, right? Um, and, you know, what you'll notice is that, um, that we never really figured out exactly what the state is, right? Um, so, <coughs> um, so that middle state corresponds to the situation where uh, where both of the both of the agents are together somewhere, we may not know exactly where, right? So, uh, but we know they're together. And then uh, those three other states correspond to situations where where we know the agents are apart, uh, and we know which beam separates them, but we don't know uh, don't know exactly uh, which one is in which spot, right? So, so so if we're in this state, for example, uh, we know we're in one zero or zero one, right? So so that means. Uh, it's either what you see here as, as the starting point or reversed, right? But we don't know, don't know which is on top and which is on the bottom, right? And it turns out we can actually never figure that out, right? This is actually a very beautiful result, right? So given this kind of graph, um, we find the right starting point. You know, maybe we know they start out together, so we start in that middle state. And then for every observation we get, we just make one transition in this graph, right? So, uh, so starting from the middle, if we get an A, then we know they, they are separated by... Uh, by beam A, and we don't know exactly, uh, 
exactly where they are, but we know they're separated by beam A, and so on, right? So, so given an observation sequence and, and a proper starting state, we can trace a path through this graph following those labels. Right? Uh, and this is very nice because if you, um, if you notice, I've assigned a color, well, not I, but uh, Tovar, Cohen, and Laval have assigned a color to each one of these, right? So, um, and those colors represent the, the output uh, of this filter. So the idea is that, uh, that as we're tracing through this observation sequence, um, when we're in the middle state, our filter should, uh, should turn on its light at the top, saying, uh, attention, filter, observer, uh, the two agents are together right now. And uh, whenever, in one of, we're, whenever we are in one of these blue states, then we get a different output, saying we know they're separated. Right? So this idea of coloring is actually very, very important, because it corresponds to the output that our filters are generating. Right? So... Uh, Okay, so that's the idea. Um, the idea at, at this point was, given a problem like this, where we have some, some discrete observations we can make that describe how a continuous system changes, we can try and draw a graph. Uh, that, try to draw a graph that, that allows us to, to keep track of the information we care about uh, in that system. So, uh, this was all very nice. It's a very beautiful result. Um, but the interesting thing, at least to me, is that... Um, the algorithm for, for going from this big 512 node graph that, uh, that I did not draw for you, uh, the algorithm for going from that to, uh, to this very nice, beautiful one, um, well, the idea was uh, step one, um, hire a graduate student. Uh, step two, wait for a year while the graduate student uh, thinks very cleverly about this problem. Uh, and then step three, write a paper, right? Um, that algorithm takes a long time, right? In fact, uh, I guess in algorithms class, we wouldn't even, uh, wouldn't even accept that as an algorithm, right? So, so the, uh, I mean, the key idea here, the observation that, that we can make from this is that uh, these reductions, the idea of going from these, these, big, these big graphs that describe in a very complicated way everything that's going on, um, down to something very simple, uh, as you see here, uh, until, until very recently, and until the results I'm going to describe for you here, um, that was, uh, that was a job for a human, right? So um, what I'd like to talk about are, uh, well, the algorithmic problem of, uh, of reducing these kinds of combinatorial filters. Right? So, um, so that's where we're going, right? We want to think about combinatorial filters. <coughs> we want to think about algorithms where the input is, is a combinatorial filter, right? So, uh, so a transition graph uh, where the edges are labeled with observations and, and the vertices are labeled with colors that represent the outputs. So we want to take one of those things and ideally we would like to be able to find the smallest filter that's equivalent. Right? So that's the idea. Okay, so, um, <coughs> okay, so throughout, uh, throughout the talk, um, I'll show you another example. This one, this one actually works out quite well, but it's, it's simple enough that maybe you can miss some of the details. And uh, Okay, so, so this one's just slightly more complicated. Uh, so here we imagine there's just one robot moving around on, on this very simple grid that I've drawn for you. And um, uh, well, you can, I hope you can just barely see. Uh, you see the different colors here? You see the red and blue? Okay, so I apologize for the, for the need to squint there. But uh, okay, so, so we have a robot moving around this, uh, this, this sort of uh, mild spiral shaped environment. And, and the goal is simply to tell whether the robot is in this left column or not. Right? So we want to keep track of that information. And whenever the robot is over here, we want to be able to say, um, we will say yes, you're here. Or uh, if the robot is not here, we want to output red. Right? So, so blue states or red states. And we want to design a filter that enables us to, uh, to keep track of that information. Right? Um, OK, so um, in this problem, I've um, we'll set it up so there are six different observations. So we care about which column we're in. Uh, but our sensor is only telling us which row we're in, right? So each of these Y's here corresponds to an observation we might get, right? So our sensor reports we're in row 0, row 1, row 2, row 3, and so on, right? Uh, <coughs> okay, so, so we've got a, got a task here, right? Uh, we know how the robot moves one step at a time. After each step, we get a measurement of which, which row the robot's in. And we want to output the correct information about which column the robot's in, right? Okay, so is it clear what, what the problem is asking for? Okay, uh, one nod, I'll take it. So, um, on the left is, uh, is what this graph looks like. Uh, and I believe this is, 
This one is designed to start from knowing exactly where the robot is, right? So we just want to be able to, to keep track of that information. Um, and it's kind of a mess, um, right? So there are, um, there are two conclusions you can draw from this mess. One is that it's, um, this is kind of complicated, right? In fact, you end up with, in this graph, one, one state for each cell uh, of the grid. And uh, yeah, we'd like to be able to reduce that. And maybe, maybe there are certain cells where we don't actually need to keep track of the difference between them. Um, another thing you'll notice is that, um, well, it's ugly. And that, that's what happens when you let software draw your graphs for you. So be, uh, watch out for that. OK, so, so we want to think about this kind of problem. Can we reduce uh, this filter you see here to something that's a little smaller? Right? And we, ideally, we'd like to find the smallest one. OK, so, uh, so we've kind of previewed this already. The problem we want to talk about is, given a filter graph, find the smallest filter that produces the same output for all plausible observation strings. Right? And uh, I guess I need to mention this, because it turns out to be uh, one of the most important details that, uh, that makes the difference for this sort of problem. Uh, it's the idea of pro plausible observation strings. So suppose, for example, the robot is along that top row uh, of, our, of our grid. Right? So at that point, the most recent observation we got would be 5. Right? And I can tell you for sure that, uh, that at the next step, the observation I get will be, well, can you tell which observations are possible? If I get 5 in one step, it's got to be a 5 or a 4 in the next step, right? Because there's no way to jump directly from 5 down to 3. Right? We've got to pass through 4 first. Um, so if I gave you an observation sequence that said uh, 5, 5, 3, 0, you know you can throw that away. Right? You know that can't happen in, in this system. Right? So there are, um, you know, if you think about, um, think about your automata theory class, where, uh, where you had an alphabet of symbols, and you needed to design automata that worked for, for every possible symbol that, uh, or symbol sequence that could occur, uh, right, sort of all of sigma star, that's, uh, well, I mean, that works okay in that context, but here we don't need to worry about all those things, right? Uh, we know we can never jump from five to three or from four to two and so on, right? And you can see that in the graph, because uh, we've got a lot of missing edges, right? Um, so just, uh, just picking this one for example, hey, maybe this was even the one we were talking about. Um, <coughs> so we've got um, outgoing edges for, uh, for observation four or observation five, uh, but no other ones, right? So we've got a lot of missing edges. That turns out to make a big difference here. Okay, so given a filter, find the smallest filter that produces the same output for all plausible observation strings, right? Uh, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll give you two results here. Um, one is, uh, I'll give you some bad news. This problem turns out to be hard, and I'll show you the, uh, show you the proof. Uh, this problem is hard. Um, then I will, uh, I will propose an algorithm that seems to work fairly well for this, um, and um, sort of leave, uh, at, least, uh, at least for the rest of the morning, uh, as an open question, um, you know, whether, we can, uh, whether we can get some better guarantees for, from that kind of algorithm. OK, so, uh, okay, so let's. Oh, actually, before the first result, um, perhaps some of you are seeing this kind of problem and thinking, man, this looks familiar, right? Anybody feel that way? Uh, okay, so um, if it feels familiar, then perhaps it feels familiar from the context of, uh, of automata theory. Uh, one of the, the classic algorithms you learn in automata theory is, uh, is DFA reduction. Is, is, that, is that where it's coming from? Okay, so, um, so good, good. So when I started thinking about this problem, I thought the same thing. Right? Ah, I've seen this before. Let me, uh, let me open my automata theory textbook, implement that algorithm, and everything will be fine. Um, and um, I discovered after, well, I won't tell you how long I worked on this before I discovered the difference. Um, discovered that there's actually this very important difference between the two. Right? So uh, it turns out that, that given uh, a deterministic finite automaton, it is actually uh, very easy to, to find the smallest equivalent DFA. Right? Uh, it has kind of a dynamic programming sort of flavor to it. Um, but you'll recall that I emphasized very strongly this idea of plausible uh, observation strings. Right? So um, the thing you notice when you're reducing a DFA is you, you never have any decisions to make. If there are two states that are indistinguishable in the DFA reduction algorithm, then, then go crazy, right? Uh, merge them together and, um, and continue along your, along your way, right? Um, but since... Um, uh, in these filters, since we can be missing some edges from the fact that we only care about plausible information, 
plausible observation strings. Since we can be missing some edges, now we have choices to make. Right? So, so for example, um, if we could take this middle state right, that has outgoing edges to, uh, on observation one we go to red, on observation two we go to green, uh, and there's two candidates. Right? I could certainly merge uh, this state with this one. Right? Uh, so, uh, so we would get the right colors there. Right? So uh, if we merge these two, then we would have on one go to red, on two go to green, on three go to blue. And that would be fine, right? That wouldn't create any problems. Right? Um, or uh, I could also merge the, this one you see in the middle uh, with this one. Right? And then we would get a combined state where on one you go to red, on two you go to green, and on three you go to purple, right? Also no problem, right? But we've got a decision to make at this point, right? If we want to reduce this filter, um, you know, if, we, if we want to reduce this, this sort of fragment of a bigger filter from three states down to two, we have to decide, do we go this way or that way? Right? And uh, just from this local information, it's hard to tell which one is the right thing to do. Right? So that's, that's some of the kind of intuition for why this is, this is different from the, uh, from the problem that may be, may be gnawing at the back of your mind, where this seems kind of familiar. Please. Okay, very good. So, um, <coughs> so the question is about a about a trap state. And right? so, sometimes if you're feeling uh, if you're feeling lazy, you can can omit some edges for DFA and just have an implicit trap state, which uh, loops back to itself and and does not accept any any strings from that point. Right? Um, the answer is no. Right? So, um, so it's not that we just don't feel like writing down the edges. It's that we um, is that we know from the structure of the problem that those observations cannot occur, right? That that those strings will not happen, right? So, if you want to think about it in terms of the uh, in terms of languages, um, so there's uh, there's some language that describes uh, that describes you know, strings that that are plausible for the original input filter, right? Ones that that only follow edges that are plausible, right? And we're only thinking about that language, right? So, uh, so we're not saying you know if if you get a, an observation that doesn't have an edge, then, um, then just go off to some dead state somewhere. Um, we're saying that doesn't happen. Right? Um, so we, we don't handle those things at all. With regard to the, the trap state uh, and the invalid observation, uh, go to the trap state, um, can't image and um, close the. Yeah, okay, so, so suppose we did have a trap state here, right? So, uh, so in that case, uh, for each of these three fragments, we draw in another edge saying, go from here to a trap state, right? Uh, what color should the trap state be? Right, so we, uh, in these filters, we need an output color for each one. Uh, and, um, right, so in that case, we would, um, okay, so if we had a trap state, then, then we would not be able to merge these things, right? Is, is, is it clear? Uh, so if we have a trap state, then, then on, on observation y2, we would go to the trap state, right? Uh, which means we need to keep these two distinct. That makes these two distinguishable, right? Because this one goes to the trap state on y2, this one goes to, to green on y2, right? And, um, and that, that's unsatisfactory because we want to be able to merge these two, right? We really want to keep this not as a, as a transition to a state we, do, we just don't feel like writing down. We want to keep this as a, as a don't care condition, right? That uh, from this state, um, you know, we're welcome to have an edge for y2 uh, because <clears throat> when we get to this point in the original filter, we'll never get a y2, right? It really does turn out to be different. I, um, so, so I mentioned we thought about this for a while, uh, tried to write some code. Um, I, uh, I can show you the code with the trap state and, and show you that it doesn't reduce the filters properly. And it's based on this idea that we want to be able to, uh, to merge states together. Right? Uh, and we can't do that if there's an implicit edge there for the trap state. <coughs> okay, so um, let, me, uh, let me give you an outline of what the proof looks like here. So, uh, so we'll do this by... Um, Surprisingly enough, or perhaps unsurprisingly, we'll do this by a reduction from the, from the three-coloring problem. Right? So uh, I'm guessing many of you have seen this, this idea before. So the three-coloring problem is uh, given an undirected graph, uh, you know, assign colors to each of the nodes in that graph, 
uh, such that there are no more than three colors and, um, and no two adjacent nodes share a color, right? Um, <coughs> this is sort of well known to be, uh, to be an NP-complete problem. Well, let me be careful. Um, deciding whether, whether you can assign three colors to a graph is known to be NP-complete. OK, so, so given an instance of that problem, and I'll, I'll show you an example here. Um, given an instance of that problem, we want to form a filter such that, um, well, it turns out that if that filter can be reduced down to, uh, to seven nodes or less, then the original graph uh, can be three colored, right? Uh, so here's what it looks like. Uh, so for this example graph, uh, well, there's actually three parts to the filter. We have a start node here that, that we'll just label zero. Uh, and then we have two final nodes that we'll label one and two. Uh, so those are always there uh, for, any, uh, for any instance of three coloring. Then all the other original uh, edges of the graph, we add to this middle layer. Okay. And it turns out this filter only always runs for, for only two steps. Right. Um, so what's the basic idea here? <coughs> the basic idea is that we want to use the edges of the original three coloring instance to force uh, these, these vertices in the middle layer to remain separate. So, uh, so how do we do that? Well, OK, so the first transition is easy, right? Uh, each vertex of the three coloring instance gets its own observation. Right? Um, so we'll go to sort of A, uh, again, I'd let, the, let the software draw this for me, A, B, C, or D, right? So each one has its own distinct observation. <coughs> right, so, um, so we'll reach one of those. Um, then uh, in the second level, we add one edge, uh, or one transition for each edge in the original graph. Right, so in the original graph, there is a, uh, actually we had not one, but two transitions for each edge in the original graph. Right? The original graph has an edge between A and B. Right? So, so we include an edge uh, labeled sort of AB, right? so we create a new observation for that edge. And we have outgoing, uh, outgoing transitions from both A and B uh, for, for that one. Right? So, so one will go to, uh, uh, to vertex one and one goes to vertex two. Right? Is it clear what's happening? Right. Basically, we want to, um, <coughs> if, we, um, if we have an edge between A and B, we want to force any algorithm that, that tries to reduce this filter to keep A and B separate. Right? We want to make sure that, that there's enough information in any reduced filter to, to distinguish A from B. Right? So in other words, um, suppose we have a filter that cannot distinguish A from B, right? where the A and B are merged together, for example. Um, in that case, um, we'll reach a situation where in the reduced filter, we don't know whether the original filter would have been at A or at B. Right? Then if we get observation AB, we don't know whether the next output should be red or green. Right? This is, uh, let me pause here for a second, because this is kind of the main idea that makes the, the proof work. Right? Um, <clears throat> since there are transitions from, from both A and B that lead to different colors, then any reduced filter has to, uh, has to distinguish A from B. Right? We need to make sure there's enough information to know whether, we've, whether we were at A or at B, because if we, we, we don't keep them separate enough to know that, then, then we don't know whether the next answer should be red or green. Right? So, <coughs> so if A, A and B cannot be distinguished in the reduced filter, then, um, then the reduced filter cannot be correct. Right? Does the idea make sense? Right, so, so that's the whole construction here. Uh, you know, we have these three nodes that are present in each one. Then from our three coloring instance, we copy in all of those vertices uh, into the middle layer. And we wire them up with one edge for each vertex from the first stage. And for each edge in the graph, two, two transitions, one to red and one to green, uh, to force those, those two nodes to, to have separate colors. OK, so, so that's the idea. Uh, here's what it looks like. Uh, maybe this will help with the intuition a little bit. Um, so in this case, uh, the graph was three colorable. And did I say seven before? Right? It actually, turns out, it turns out you need to have six. Um, <coughs> so in this case, uh, this filter can be reduced to an equivalent one of size, um, of size six. Right? So the same three have got to be there. Uh, and that's easy to see because they have their own distinct colors. Right? There's only one white vertex. Only one uh, green one and only one red one, right? So for the empty observation sequence, we've got to have a node for that. Uh, we have to have at least one green one, at least one red one, and one is sufficient, right? So those three are fixed. Then the other three turn out to correspond back to the colors uh, of the three coloring instance, 
right? So um, in this three coloring ex instance example that I'm showing you, uh, turns out that we can color uh, A and C with the same color, and that matches back to, to the idea that, that A and C can be merged when we're reducing the combinatorial filter, right? So, so here it's, it's sufficient and correct to have, uh, to have one state called AC, and then if we get observation A or observation C, either one, that's fine, we go to this merged state. And I guess we want to make sure there's no ambiguities, right? Um, <coughs> right so for example, we had an edge, uh, we have an edge between B and C, so, uh, yeah, so this state has a transition for, uh, for that observation BC, right? The observation corresponding to that edge. Um, but we know exactly which, uh, which of those two states we merge together corresponds to this edge, right? It can't be, uh, can't be B because B is not a member here. So it's got to be C. And so we know that one goes to, uh, to green, right? Does that make sense? That's a, um, <coughs> and so even if the nuts and bolts are, are not completely clear, I hope the, uh, hope the overall message here is. So given a three-coloring instance, we can form an instance of our filter reduction problem in polynomial time in such a way that, um, that if the, uh, let's see, this is hard to, hard to say out loud, there's so many prepositions you need to string together. Um, if the filter reduction instance can be reduced down to, uh, down to a size of six or less, then the original graph can be three colored, right? So um, therefore, if there's a polynomial time algorithm for solving this uh, filter reduction problem, then there would be a polynomial time algorithm for solving three coloring, and uh, at that point, at that point, the world goes crazy, right? Okay, so, so, so we, can, we can conclude that, that this filter reduction problem is NP-hard. NP right? Yeah? Uh, okay. <coughs> okay, so that's, uh, that's one result. Um, I guess it's natural to try and, try and finish this off, right? So, um, so in addition to NP-hardness, we'd like to say it's NP-complete, and, and that turns out not to be too hard to do. Right? So we just need a... Uh, so if someone happens to, to give us an answer, we just need a polynomial time algorithm for, uh, for confirming that, that answer is correct. Right. So in other words, given two filters, can we, um, uh, can we decide whether those two filters are equivalent or not? Right. And uh, that is not hard to do. Right. So we can think of, uh, think of a forward search, you know, essentially uh, across all, well, not all observation strings, but uh, yeah, across all observation strings, we enumerate the pairs of, of states across those two filters that we can reach at the same time. Right? So given F1 and F2, um, what are all of the uh, pairs of states, you know, one state from F1 and one state from F2, that can be reached by any observation sequence? Right? So we use a priority queue and search forward through those two graphs simultaneously, finding all these pairs. And if we get the same color from every pair of reachable uh, for every reachable pair, then, then we know that those two are equivalent, right? And it's, uh, that's reasonably efficient to do that, right? So, so we get this, this nice NP completeness result. Okay, so, uh, so that's, that was all very nice. Um, <coughs> and I guess we could stop there, right? Since we know that um, we don't have a whole lot of hope of finding a polynomial time algorithm for, for this problem. But we thought we did... Uh, we're writing robotics papers. Uh, reviewers of robotics papers like to see pretty pictures at the end. So, uh, so we thought we'd think a little bit about uh, about how we might try to solve this problem in practice. Right? Uh, so we did uh, <coughs> we, we did design uh, an algorithm that uh, that produces correct filters and tries its hardest to uh, uh, to reduce these things. Uh, the algorithm is efficient, but we can't actually promise you that it's going to find the smallest one. Okay, so here's how it works. Uh, it's based on this idea of a conflict. Uh, so we want to say that two states are in conflict with one another if, uh, if they have the same color, uh, but there's some observation under which they should go to a different color. Right? So at the, top of this, uh, at the top of the slide there, you see an example where, where A and B are in conflict because uh, they're both red, uh, but if we get observation Y, they should go to a different, different color, right? From B, we go to D, which is, green, which is blue. From A, we go to C, which is green, right? So uh, in other words, when we have a conflict, that means that, uh, that we should not merge A with, with B, right? So if we don't have any conflicts, then it, uh, in a way, it feels kind of safe to, uh, to replace A and B with one, one merge state A, B, right? Uh, in this case, we do have a conflict, so, um, so we, we probably shouldn't do that. Well, we, we definitely shouldn't do that. 
I mean, there's a, uh, there's a kind of a straightforward example. So here's a filter with seven states. Uh, so we've got blues on the bottom and reds on the top. And um, I guess the important thing you'll notice is that, that there's no conflicts between, uh, between any of the red ones or any of the blue ones, right? So, um, so the reds have only zeros as outgoing edges, and uh, the, all those zeros lead to blue. So no conflicts for A, so we can merge all those together. <coughs> Same thing for blue, right? We have a bunch of zero outputs that, that lead to red. Um, and this one, you know, single one uh, that leads to green, right? Um, so we can merge all those together, right? And we know that, that, that it's consistent with itself, right? On, from blue, on zero, we go to red, and on one, we go to green, right? So this is, this is kind of a, so the top shows a bad example where there's things we, we ought not merge together. Uh, on the bottom is one where, we, where everything kind of merges together, where there's no conflicts at all, and it becomes, uh, becomes pretty, pretty straightforward, right? Um, I hope you're noticing here that, that if we have no conflicts, then, <coughs> then it's well defined to, uh, to merge together uh, two of those states, right? But we never get any situation where, there are, where we end up with two outgoing edges with the same observation uh, going to two different places, right? Okay, so that's the idea. Um, so given that concept of, of conflicts, we can... Um, well, we can form an algorithm to try and reduce the, the graph, right? So, so here's that example that we started with at the beginning. Um, we can, um, so we'll pick one color just to, uh, just to keep it simple. We'll start with the blue ones, right? So there are, uh, there are six blue states, and we can form a conflict graph. So, uh, so it looks like this. turns out there's only two edges. And uh, just to be specific here, um, actually, the two conflicts are between, um, between this state and this one. Right and uh, and those top two between the uh, the top blue one and the and the and the penultimate blue one there at the top right. Uh, otherwise, there's no conflicts. All the all the other ones are free to merge together. And our basic idea is, given this conflict graph, let's find a coloring of that conflict graph. Right. And so um, you know these are all blue nodes. They are nodes that should be should be outputting blue in our final filter. Uh, so so I like to just think of it as as choosing different shades of blue, right? So we separate these blue ones into, um, into light blue and dark blue, right? So, so here's one way to, to do that coloring. Uh, notice this is only one way, and there's some, some freedom in how we do that, and it's not, uh, uh, <coughs> not so clear what the right choice is, and it's not so clear how much that matters, right? But, uh, but there's one way to color it. Um, and the idea is that we uh, form the conflict graph, color it, and then we, uh, then we apply that color... That, that coloring back to the original graph, right? So this is giving us, a, giving us a refinement of the original coloring, right? So instead of all of them being blue, now we have some dark blue and, or some, some, dark blue and some light blue, right? Uh, and notice after we do this, now there's no more conflicts, right? Um, since we only get a conflict when the two have the same color, then, then everything's okay, right? Okay, so, so that's sort of nice. We can eliminate those conflicts for, uh, for the blue ones. Notice that this may generate some other conflicts within, within the red, right? So we need to iterate this process. So pick your favorite color, uh, form its conflict graph, color the conflict graph, and then, then apply that back to the, to the original filter graph, right? Uh, <coughs> you'll notice that, um, well, I'm using the word color a lot. In particular, uh, we want to color this conflict graph and ideally, we want to do that with a minimum number of colors, right? Uh, and of course, uh, we've already leveraged the fact that, that coloring a graph with a minimum number of colors is a computationally challenging thing to do, right? So, um, so this, is where the, uh, this is where the heuristic part comes in. Uh, so pick your favorite efficient algorithm for, for coloring a graph. Uh, so we ended up using sequential greedy coloring, but pick your favorite way of coloring a graph. Um, and, and, and drop that in, right? And actually, what we observed is that um, we've got some good results using this, uh, this idea of just sort of ordering the nodes and um, processing them in order and assigning colors uh, in that way. Um, what we observed was that if we used a, uh, an exponential time sort of optimal coloring algorithm, that we did get optimally reduced filters, right? So that's uh, actually kind of an open problem to ask... Um, to ask whether using this approach, using, getting optimal colorings of the conflict graph always gives you uh, an optimally reduced filter, right? We, we don't know the answer to that yet. Okay, so that's the idea. Here's, uh, here's kind of the pseudocode, right? So uh, as long as there's a conflicted color, uh, find, its, uh, find its conflict graph, color the conflict graph, and then refine those colorings, right? Uh, 
And then we iterate that until all the colors are happy. Uh, right, so we have, now we have another filter with the same number of states, but with, uh, with more colors than we started with. Right? Uh, but now we know there's, there's no conflicts, which means everything that's the same color after those refinements, we collapse down together. Right? Uh, <coughs> and then, uh, right, so, we, so we merge same colored states. And then um, now we need to just translate everything back to our original color set. Right, so, uh, so we've got some light blue, some medium blue, some dark blue, uh, various different shades of red. Um, uh, but we need something that gives us the same output. Right? So maybe we need different shades of red uh, to eliminate the conflicts. Um, but in the end, we would just want to output red when, when the original filter said red. So, uh, so after we're done with all this merging, we, we erase all those different shades and just go back to, go back to red and blue in this example. Right? OK, and then we're done. Right? So um, this is what it looks like when you're finished. With, with that example. Um, so we started out with one state for, um, one state for each, each cell of the grid. Turns out there's lots of places where we just really don't care what's happening. Right? So, uh, so for example, uh, uh, I mean, it's hard to get, get much intuition about it from here, but um, for example, if the, uh, if the robot is, is in the middle of this, uh, this blue part, there's no need for us to keep track of exactly where it is. Right? So if it's anywhere between uh, between row one and row four, uh, all those are sort of equivalent, right? Uh, we know that at the next step we're going to still be within blue, right? And we really only start to care about the difference when we get up to uh, up to five or down to zero, right? Because then we know we might uh, <coughs> we might stay there and then switch over to um, you know, to this red part, and so we have to start giving different answers, right? So uh, so we can do some some fairly significant collapsing. One thing you notice is that there's actually only two blue states left down from the original six. Right? So that we get actually fairly nice, uh, nice compression here. Right? OK, so, so that's the whole algorithm. Um, there's a few other examples that, that we could take a look at, although we're kind of running low on time here. So I'll, I'll discuss this quickly. Um, here's another problem where uh, we also have kind of a donut shape. Um, but now instead of, uh, of two agents, we've got just one. Right? So this is sort of easier to keep track of. And, and our goal in this case is, um, is to tell uh, wow, that's, uh, that's completely invisible. Um, to tell whether this one agent is within that, uh, in that region between A and E. Right? So it, it's meant to be shaded there. Uh, right, so how can we do that? Well, uh, after things get started, you know, as long as you know whether, whether the robot, as long as you know the robot is outside, then you just wait for an A or an E. Right? And when that, when that happens, we know we're inside. Then the next A or E, we know we're outside. Right? Um, so we can do that. Um, this is kind of the, uh, the very basic version of this filter that we might get, where, where the first observation we get tells us uh, you know, down to just one or two possibilities where we are, and then, then we can keep going from there. Um, we can try to reduce this using some kind of randomized approach. and It, it works OK. We're able to get some merging. But actually, if we use uh, optimal coloring, we get this very nice, um, this nice view that matches to, to what we want. Right? So, um, I guess the, uh, the states that are the most interesting here are those two on the, uh, on the top, top right. Uh, so one corresponding to, to being in the goal region, and we know that that's correct, right? So, uh, so the output is red there. Um, and then notice uh, there's one for sort of everywhere else. And anytime we see A or E, we know we've moved into the goal region. And then when we see A or E again, we move out of the goal region. And those other three states are actually just for sort of startup purposes, right? Uh, so this is kind of exactly what we want. And actually, if you think about it, this can scale up, right? So, so beyond just these five regions, suppose we had a million different, uh, different regions. We don't really need to keep track of those million different possibilities, right? We just need to know the robot is in the goal or the robot is out there somewhere, right? And this algorithm is able to kind of capture those kinds of things, right? Okay, and um, yeah, I know this is a theoretical audience, so it's a little strange to be showing these kinds of, uh, of plots where I, where I actually wrote code and measured time and all these kinds of things. Um, but just to give you some intuition for, um, for the fact that this works fairly well, so for this problem, um, we tried it with lots of different kinds of coloring approaches. And the dashed line you see here is the, uh, the, size, of the, the size of the unreduced filter as the number of beams increases. Right? And of course, that increases linearly. Um, <coughs> I believe it's you know, something, like, something like 2n. Um, and you know, the, the message you can see here from from this dense tangle of, of, of lines is that uh, it seems not to matter a whole lot what, uh, what coloring algorithm you use. Right? OK, um, 
And yeah, there's, there's some other problems here, but uh, uh, again, it's a theory audience, so I won't, won't spend too much time talking about these things. And actually, I'm about out of time, so let me just mention, um, <coughs> mention some other kinds of extensions to this work. We've also thought about uh, how to use these same kinds of ideas to, to solve planning problems. Right? So, so you can see here a grid, grid problem where the, we've got a robot that, uh, that starts at the, at the S and wants to get to either of these two Gs uh, by moving one step at a time. Right? And <coughs> right? So uh, if we're looking for just the shortest number of steps we can take, well, yeah, I guess we would go down, right, down, down, left. Right? Down, right, down, down, left. So that would be six steps. Um, Right, so, so we could try something like this. Right? And so we're imagining there's a goal detector. Right? So those zero transitions indicate we didn't see the goal yet, we didn't see the goal yet, and then finally we see it. Um, and then uh, this is a little different than those filters. Right? So now rather than outputs, we're labeling each state with an action the robot should take. Right? So we can get this kind of graph that describes what the, what the robot should do. Um, I hope you can see that's not the smallest graph that solves this problem. Right? Can you think of a smaller one? Well, maybe something like this. <clears throat> right, so, so in this case, we can go uh, alternate up and right. right? So, uh, and as long as we don't see the goal, we continue alternating up and right uh, uh, until we see the goal, and then we terminate. Right? So these t's indicate that, that we're done at that point. Right? <coughs> so it's kind of a cute result right? that um, the, the smallest plan that solves a problem may, uh, may actually not be anything close to the, to the shortest one. Right? Um, and I, I have a lot more that I could say about this, but, that, but I won't, um, other than to say this was surprisingly difficult to, to make much progress on. Um, you could prove it's NB hard using basically the same kind of trick that, you, that we used for, um, uh, for the filter reduction case. <coughs> but the, uh, the next step of finding an algorithm that, uh, that seems to do a decent job at it was, um, uh, was remarkably difficult, um, primarily because... Um, it doesn't show up here, but if you have, for example, uh, in a grid world where there's a big open space, and you have lots and lots of choices for how to, how to traverse through that open space. Right? And using local information, it's kind of impossible to tell which, uh, which of those ways to traverse through a big open region is, is the right choice. Right? Um, so, uh, so we have you know, we've proposed a couple of ways of tackling this, but um, you know, I consider, consider this question kind of wide open. Uh, as, to, you know, as to finding a, a decent way of solving these kinds of problems. Okay, uh, and, uh, yeah, okay, so there's uh, some motivation. Okay, so that, that's, that's all I'll say for now, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions about this kind of thing, if you have any. Please. Okay, so you're asking about the, uh, the, the distance of the squares? Um, I'm not sure I understand. So, um, oh, I, I see. So, yes, I'm, okay, I will answer now. Um, <coughs> so it depends, right? Um, if, uh, uh, let me answer, please, please. Um, if you want to minimize the distance the robot travels, then this one is better. Right? This one has distance, uh, let's use Manhattan metric, right? One, two, three, four, five. The top one has distance one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If you want to minimize distance traveled, this one is better. Um, right? It's actually very well known how to, how to find these kinds of plans to minimize the distance traveled, right? Um, even breadth first search can, can do that for these sorts of problems. The question I'm asking here is not what's the shortest plan that reaches the goal. The question I want to ask is, what's the smallest plan that reaches the goal? So I'm measuring not the distance the robot is traveling, I'm measuring the complexity of the instructions. Right? So in this case, um, the, the distance traveled is farther, but, um, but the plan is actually more concise. So that, that's the difference. So you can think of an analogy maybe to... Um, um, Okay, so this is outdated in the, now that we have GPS, but um, in the past, maybe you're giving your friend instructions to reach right? Um, there's one very, very fast way to get there that requires knowing all the exact streets, um, many complicated turns, right? So maybe it would take a long time to describe that, that shortest way. 
Uh, or maybe there's a more compact way of describing it that uh, it stays on some major roads and it's just, just two or three turns, right? Th that's the, the phenomenon you're seeing here, right? So, so maybe it takes longer, but you can describe the, uh, describe the instructions more compactly. Any other questions? Okay, so um, that's an excellent question, um, to which I can give a very short answer, no. Um, <coughs> so I'm, I'm guessing there are, um, how many people are here? Uh, I'm guessing, um, guessing there are many people in the room that, um, that have more skill with, with approximation algorithms than I do. Right? So um, the key thing I will say is that, um, if, you, if your approximation algorithm looks anything like, uh, like the approach we take, then the approximation factor you get should depend very strongly on, uh, on the specific uh, coloring algorithm you use for the conflict graph. I, so. uh. I mean, uh, since the problem, at least uh, the special assistance that we showed, are equivalent to coloring, uh, free coloring the graphs. And so this is going to be very hard. So if, you, so if I give you a graph with a free coloring, I think the best algorithm that exists um, for coloring is hmm. maybe n to the 0 0.2 color. Like oh, okay. So, so uh, it seems like, I mean, if you want to have a good approximation, it's a good for you problem. But in particular, I need to solve this problem. Oh, okay. So, so, so we would have to revolutionize another field to, yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah. yeah so, um, Again, I, I don't know the answer. Um, there's a much bigger expert than I am suggesting that um, that there's reason to be pessimistic about uh, about getting good approximations. But I, I, I personally, I can't say any more than that. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, I will. I will try. Okay. So here's the idea. Um, the important part is in the middle level, right? Uh, so we take every, uh, every vertex in our three-coloring instance and, and create, a, um, uh, create a vertex in the middle layer of our filter. <coughs> Here's our goal. Um, I want to make sure that any filter reduction algorithm can, can merge or collapse a pair of states if and only if it's OK to give them the same color in the, uh, the three-coloring instance. Right? So, uh, so if there's no edge between them, such as between A and D, then I want to set up a filter where it doesn't matter if, if the filter loses track of, of am I at A or am I at D. Right? Uh, so, so for example, on a three-coloring instance where there, were, um, uh, where there were no edges at all, then, um, then all of these edges go away, right? And so I just get a transition from white to blue, and the, the reduced filter is very simple, right? Uh, all of them can collapse together. Right? Um, on the other hand, if I have an edge in my three-coloring instance, then I need to make sure that the two states corresponding to that remain distinct. Right? And I do that by, um, by creating a conflict between them. Right? By giving them uh, an outgoing edge that has the same, uh, has the same label. Right? So, okay, let me draw it here. Um, so I have A and B, right, in the three-coloring instance. Um, in the filter, I want to generate edges that look like this. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I want to do that in such a way that um, that they both have the same same observation. Right. So, just to give it a unique name, I call it Y A B. Right. So for every edge in the three coloring instance, I generate this structure in the graph. Right. So this is, in fact, exactly the kind of conflict that, that I described later on. Right. <coughs> so, so I need to make sure that, uh, that any path that leads to A leads to a different place uh, to get to B. Right. Is, it, is this helping at all? Right. So A and B must remain distinct in the reduced filter. Because if they are... Um, if they're merged in the reduced filter, then if I get this observation YAB, I don't know whether the next color should be blue or red. Right? Um, so therefore, I can, you know, given a reduced, uh, uh, reduced filter, um, I, can, you know, I can look. You know, uh, 
yeah, given these, these original observations, right, so this. And I can look and see if they, they get collapsed or not. I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but I've at least drawn a different picture of the same idea. Does it help? Okay. Okay. What other questions can I answer about this? Okay, so I, I guess that's, uh, that's all I will say about that, and thanks very much for your attention.